So hi everyone, my name is Julia Mayetta. We are so pleased that you all could join us for this week's lecture of volume two in our 12 week No Neuropsychology Didactic Series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free high quality didactic opportunities. We would like to thank our sponsors for their financial support of the series. Um, and before we begin, here are some disclaimers for the series. Uh, this training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology, and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions for our presenter today can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen, and we are recording today's session, um, and we'll put it on our website later this week. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Keenan Walker for today's lecture on inflammatory and immune function in Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Walker is a tenure track investigator at the National Institute on Aging's Intramural, Intramural Research Program and an adjunct faculty member in Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine's Department of Neurology. He is a clinical neuropsychologist and early career scientist conducting patient-oriented research to identify risk factors and etiological pathways associated with Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Walker's research focuses on understanding how abnormal immune function, inflammation, and cardiovascular disease relate to the development and progression of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Walker completed his bachelor's degree in psychology and cognitive neuroscience from Johns Hopkins University and earned his doctorate degree in clinical psychology from St. John's University in 2016. Dr. Walker completed his APA accredited internship at UC San Diego and then completed his postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neuropsychology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. In 2019, he was the recipient of a K-23 Career Development Award from the National Institute on Aging for a five-year study examining the role of systemic inflammation and neuroinflammation in the progression of late-life cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease pathology. So we are so pleased to have Dr. Walker with us today, and I'm gonna turn it over to him. Thank you, Julia, for that wonderful introduction, and thanks everyone for being here. And thank you to No Neuropsychology for inviting me to speak. So let me know if, you have, if there's any audio issues, but I'll go ahead and proceed. So as Julia mentioned, I'm gonna talk about uh, the role of inflammatory function and immune function in Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline in older adults. And before I go on, um, just my disclosures, I received intramural research uh, funding from the well, intramural research program at NIH. And a shameless plug here. So I did just move from Johns Hopkins to the NIH and I'm starting up a lab. Uh, the lab is called the Multimodal Imaging of Neurodegenerative Disease or the MIND lab. And I'm currently recruiting postdocs. So if if you're in a position uh, where you know, a postdoc is on the horizon and you're interested in what you see today, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy to discuss. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. So we know the neurobiology of Alzheimer's disease is highly complex. There's a couple canonical pathways though. We know it involves this A-beta oligomerization and aggregation, this, this phosphorylization of tau and the development of tau neurofibrillary tangles and also inflammation. So this is you know, another major component of Alzheimer's disease, but it's poorly understood. It's thought to influence the, the rate of progression, however, but there is some debate as to whether or not it's helpful or pathogenic. So much of my work has really been focused on understanding this role of inflammation in cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. And I've been particularly interested in um, peripheral inflammation. That's infl inflammation occurring throughout the body. So the thinking is, or our current hypothesis is, is that peripheral inflammation can actually influence neuroinflammation. And when I say neuroinflammation, I mean activation of microglia and astrocytes in the brain um, to give off pro-inflammatory mediators. There's quite a bit of evidence from rodent models suggesting that this may actually lead to neurophysiological molecular abnormalities like a beta, aggregation and tau hyperphosphorylation that then leads to downstream neurodegenerative changes and ultimately cognitive decline. But before I go further, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So I want to define inflammation 
So we can think of inflammation as a biological response to a harmful stimuli. So this can be something like a pathogen, so bacterial or viral infection, but also tissue injury or damaged cells. And it's a response that, you know, like we see on the, on the right, involves uh, the vasculature and the immune cells. Now, the goal of inflammation is to really help the immune system to eliminate pathogens or clear these, uh, this dead tissue and ultimately uh, to, to repair the tissue. So if all goes correctly, inflammation is a helpful uh, adaptive response. And I, I think of inflammation as being falling into one of two categories. It can either be local. Now, local inflammation is something we've all experience. For example, if you've ever sprained your ankle, you know, that causes tissue damage. That tissue damage causes a local inflammatory response in the area surrounding the ankle. And on the other hand, we have systemic inflammation, which is less common, especially uh, for those of you watching in, in your age group, right? So systemic inflammation is inflammation occurring throughout the body. And it's a result of, you know, persistent repeated or widespread immune activation. And I, I like to use this cartoon here to illustrate um, conditions that may actually lead or thought to lead to systemic inflammation. So lots of cardiovascular risk factors that we're all very familiar with. In addition to that, um, well, obesity I wanna point out is a major one. Adipose tissue is a major source of pro-inflammatory proteins um, in the body but also things like a micro, gut microbiome dysbiosis, uh, infection, chronic infection, acute infection, tissue injury. So this can be physical trauma, uh, surgery, major burns, autoimmune conditions. These are all things that can contribute to systemic inflammation, but it can also occur outside the context of uh, clinical disease, right? So systemic inflammation can occur in people who are otherwise appear healthy. And it's thought to be a result in this instance of sort of age-related physiologic processes like aging of cells, aging of the immune system. And this paper that was published last year by Parker and colleagues showed that as people grow older, there tends to be this linear increase in pro-inflammatory mediators in the blood. So this is just two of them, TNF-alpha and its receptor. But you see even you know, starting from 30 onward, we see this increase in inflammatory proteins. So there's quite a bit of evidence linking immune function to Alzheimer's disease specifically. And I'd say the most compelling is probably the genetic evidence. Evidence from genome-wide association studies specifically uh, have shown that many of the risk variants uh, for Alzheimer's disease are on or near genes that are involved in innate, innate immune function, right? So we have complement receptor one, CD33, and TREM2. These are all you know, receptors on um, macrophage or immune cells, right? And we have a number of other genes that are known to be risk variants for Alzheimer's disease that are known to be involved in innate immune function. And all of each of these are highlighted in blue. And so you see from a genetic perspective, um, Alzheimer's disease is in, in largely etiologically uh, as a result of immune dysfunction in addition to other processes as well listed here. Dr. Walker, I apologize for interrupting. I think your slides are not advancing. It looks like we're still on the defining inflammation slide on our side. Okay, let me stop sharing and share real quick. Okay. That's much better. Now we can see the, the table right there. Oh, okay, so hopefully I was able to describe it well enough. But um, so yeah, this plot on the right, I'll just review this really quickly. It shows the most of the risk variants for Alzheimer's disease. Those in blue are risk variants that are known to have a role in immune function. So you know, a big component of the genetic etiology of Alzheimer's disease is known to be immune related. Now, a more recent genome-wide association study identified 29 risk variants, and the, the authors actually functionally profiled each of the risk variants and found that you know, when you added up over 60% of the genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease 
is attributable to genes that are primarily expressed by microglial cells. You know, not necessarily astrocytes, not necessarily neurons, but, but microglia seem to be most relevant in terms of the genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease. And we know of microglia as the brain's resident immune cell. It's essentially a macrophage you know, that takes up residence in the brain and you know, conduct, is important for things like phagocytosis. Now, GWAS studies alone su would suggest that Alzheimer's disease is in large part an immunological disorder. But there's evidence from other areas of research as well. So observational studies have shown time and time again, there's probably over a hundred of these, showing that individuals uh, who are clinically diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment or early Alzheimer's disease, they tend to have higher levels of pro-inflammatory proteins in the blood and in the cerebrospinal fluid. You have post-mortem studies which show that individuals who are pathologically diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, they tend to, on autopsy, show this uh, you know, A-beta plaques that are surrounded by microglial cells, you know, suggesting that there's this major immune response within the brain even before symptoms develop. And you know, then we have pharmacoepi studies. So this is really interesting. Um, for example, if you look in cohorts, you'll see that people who have taken NSAIDs, for example, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or, uh, or TNF-alpha blockers or uh, steroids over long periods of time during middle adulthood, they tend to be at lower risk for developing Alzheimer's disease in late life. And actually, um, Pfizer recently ran uh, an, an analysis, a pharmacoepi analysis on their two drugs, Envo and Humira, and found that among people with rheumatoid arthritis, those who took TNF-alpha blockers had about a 60% lower risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. So there is some interest in pursuing these uh, in clinical trials. I will say that NSAIDs and steroids have been examined in a number of clinical trials over the last two decades. And both of those types of drugs have been essentially failures or the trials have been uh, inconclusive. So I think the chapter has been closed on NSAID therapies and steroid therapies for reducing inflammation uh, to reduce Alzheimer's risk, but people are still interested in these other inflammatory pathways. Okay, so here's an example of a framework that is put forth by Cunningham and colleagues, which shows how we get from how we get from an inflammatory trigger that I talked about earlier down the neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration. So lots, there's lots of different types of triggers. Infection is one, tissue injury is another, and chronic inflammatory disease is another. Irrespective of what the trigger is, um, what they do is they stimulate, well, the trigger itself gives off inflammatory stimuli. These are small molecules like lipopolysaccharide or HMGB1. These are called pathogen or damage associated molecular patterns. They interact with our white blood cells, our immune cells, our myeloid cells in the tissue and in the joints. And these, these immune cells then give off pro-inflammatory mediators. And these are the things that we measure in blood. And these are the things that many of you might be already familiar with, like IL-1, pro-inflammatory cytokines, like IL-6, but they circulate throughout the body and give off um, a state, well, they generate a state of systemic inflammation. Like, you know, we talked about what that is, but we can go from systemic inflammation to neuroinflammation through multiple routes, and they're listed here. I can talk about this a little bit more later, but it, suffice it to say that there's a strong um, peripheral immune brain connection. And we go from neuroinflammation especially when it's chronic, it's not to actually promote neurodegeneration. Now, we know that immune function plays a major role in Alzheimer's disease, especially from the genetic and observational data. But an outstanding question is, is systemic inflammation, which is a component of immune function, is it, does it actually have a mechanistic role in Alzheimer's disease? Because if, if so, then it's possible that treating systemic inflammation can reduce Alzheimer's disease risk. And if, if that is the case, it's important to understand at what point in, in the disease course it might be implicated. So this is a framework that we put forth uh, a few years ago. And just as, this is just a theory about how we might get from systemic inflammation to dementia. And here are these inflammatory triggers. 
you know, and these are things I listed. What's common about them is they become more prevalent in middle adulthood. So the thinking is that systemic inflammation during midlife starts, promotes in some individuals a state of chronic inflammation. This is this imbalance between pro-inflammatory signaling and anti-inflammatory signaling. And when we have peripheral chronic inflammation, so inflammation throughout the body, that can generate a neuroinflammatory response. So that can prime microglia, that can prime astrocytes to give off pro-inflammatory proteins, which are then, um, can then contribute to neurodegeneration. Now there's a strong connection between microglia activation and neuroinflammation and tau phosphorylation. The, the A-beta connection is a little bit weaker, um, but you know, ultimately all three of these components are thought to play a role in the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So the objective of much of the work that I've done has really been to understand this relationship between inflammation in middle adulthood and Alzheimer's disease. So the, what we've done is we looked at inflammatory proteins in the periphery, so in the blood, and related these proteins to later life neurodegeneration, cognitive decline, and neurophysiological molecular changes. Now, much of the work that I've done has been in the what's called the ERIC cohort. So it stands for the Atherosclerosis Risk and Community Study. This is a very nice cohort study that was started uh, back in uh, the late 80s and actually started with 16,000 individuals. So the, we're actually still going. We're, we just finished visit eight. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is data collected between visits one and visit six. So in... in Let's see, so one thing that's relevant is that at visit one, individuals were in their middle, middle age. So they're between 45 and 65 about. So we have middle-aged adults at the initiation of the study. At visit five, individuals are in their mid 70s. And at this point, we had about 2000 individuals undergo a brain MRI. So what we did uh, for a lot of the analysis I'm gonna show you is relate inflammatory proteins that were collected in middle adulthood to MRI characteristics and cognitive characteristics in later life. So these inflammatory proteins were you know, measured in blood that was collected at visit one when people were in their mid fifties. So we looked at a number of acute phase proteins. So these are proteins given off by the liver as a result of inflammatory signaling. And then another one three years later, C-reactive protein. Um, and this is something that's you know, widely used as an indicator of systemic inflammation. So first what we did was we looked at how these inflammatory proteins measured in middle adulthood related to late life um, brain structure. And we we're particularly interested in brain volume. So one of the things we did was we looked at how the number of elevated inflammatory proteins, and when I say elevated, I mean top quartile, how the number of elevated proteins related to late life brain volume. And you can see here in this top row that you know, we're not really seeing an association between higher number of elevated inflammatory proteins and total brain volume or ventricular volume. But when we look at regions that are vulnerable, known to be vulnerable to Alzheimer's disease pathology, uh, we do see a strong relationship. So this Alzheimer's disease signature region is a meta ROI. So it's made up of these uh, regions here, parapocampal region, interrhinal, uh, hippocampus, precuneus, all regions vulnerable to A-beta atrophy, metabolic disruption in the context of Alzheimer's disease these regions seem to be strongly associated with midlife inflammation, right? And so too does the hippocampus when we just look at it independently. And this is with adjustment for all the things that you might think of as potential confounders, adjustment for demographic characteristics, cardiovascular risk factors, and, and medication use. So we found something similar when we looked at white matter integrity as our outcome. We looked at white matter hyperintensity volume and DTI measures of fractional anisotropy and mean diffusivity. But we see, and this is just showing the data looking at mid, midlife C-reactive protein or inflammatory protein with late life white matter. We see that individuals with higher levels of CRP show reduced integrity, microstructural integrity in paraventricular regions and deep white matter regions. And we, what, the thing that's neat about the ERIC study is that you know, it has a large sample of African-Americans co-enrolled with white participants so we're able to look at race stratified analysis. And here we see fairly consistent associations across race groups, you know, which makes things easy to explain. Um, you know, there seems to be this consistent association between 
higher levels of inflammation in middle age adults and reduce white matter integrity in late life. Now we also looked at how midlife inflammation related to cognitive decline. We wanted to see how you know, these, this thing that we think is a risk factor relates to you know, longitudinal change in cognition. So we used the same sample, same study design. We included 12,000 individuals in this analysis who had a baseline cognitive assessment. First cognitive assessment was in the mid fifties. And so they had another cognitive assessment six years after that and another one 15 years after that. And it wasn't a comprehensive assessment, but we had three measures. We had a measure of memory, uh, the FAS, you know, or fluency measure, and then a measure of processing speed slash executive functioning. And we combined the three of them into a composite measure. And that's what we use as a primary outcome. But again, we related our, our pro-inflammatory proteins measured in midlife to cognitive decline over what amounted to a 20 year period spanning from middle age to late life. And so here are the first set of results. This is uh, looking at our midlife inflammation composite score. So this is the measures that were collected at visit once were combined into a composite measure. And what the figure shows is the relative or additional decline that's seen over and above those with the lowest quartile of midlife inflammation. So what this suggests is that those in the top three quartiles show a steeper rate of cognitive decline over uh, this 20 year period. And here are the actual estimates here, the Z-score estimates, but I wanna draw your attention to the percentage of additional decline because I think it's most telling. Now you see top three quartiles are, you know, if you're in the top three quartiles of midlife inflammation, you have about a 7% steeper rate of decline over a 20 year period. And same thing when we look at C-reactive protein, our other measure of, of systemic inflammation collected three years later in, in individuals who are 55 on average, we see those in the top three quartiles of C-reactive protein show again, a steeper rate of cognitive decline over a 20 year period. And these estimates are a little bit bigger. We see about eight to 12% steeper rate of decline for those in the top three quartiles. You may notice that we're not seeing a strong dose response effect, right? You know, four isn't that much higher than three, three third quartiles are that much higher than the second. One of the issues here is that people with the highest level of C-reactive protein and the highest level of our, of our composite score, they are much more likely to drop out of the study and they're much more likely to die before the final follow-up visit. So we think that it's sort of censored. Those are the highest levels of inflammation don't really get captured in follow-up. And we've done some weighting analysis and we've seen that, okay, there is more of a dose response curve if we account for this dropout of people with high levels of inflammation. So that's one thing to keep in mind in these sorts of longitudinal studies. We also looked at how midlife inflammation relates to test-specific decline. I thought this was really cool. You see this consistent association with memory decline that seems to be specific to memory because we don't, it doesn't really generalize to other cognitive domains here, even though these, these are all measured with one test. Um, but the other thing is that's neat is that it's very much consistent with what we saw with brain volume. You know, we see midlife inflammation being associated with lower brain volume in limbic region, regions that are important for memory consolidation, retrieval, et cetera. And now we're seeing the functional correlate of that um, you know, over a longitudinal you know, course. Now, other studies have shown that midlife inflammation is relevant to progression to dementia. And actually the first study to do this oh, did it two decades ago. And really there wasn't much data in the you know, intervening like 15 years, but uh, Lenore Launer's group from the Honolulu Asia Aging Study showed that you know, people with higher levels of inflammation in middle adulthood were at greater risk for developing dementia over a 25 year follow up period. Now, more recently in the Framingham Heart uh, Study, they showed that low grade inflammation in middle adulthood was also associated with Alzheimer's disease, but especially so in people who were at the major Alzheimer's disease risk bearing that APO a lipoprotein E4 allele. So there seems to be some synergy between some of the Alzheimer's disease genetics and peripheral inflammation. And then in our, our group, using the BioCard cohort, so it's a different uh, cohort, uh, in this study led by Alden Gross, he showed that people with higher levels of soluble TNF alpha receptor one, which is an inflammatory receptor, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, they had higher risk of developing mild cognitive impairment. So we're seeing midlife inflammation being associated with MCI and dementia risk and cognitive decline across multiple cohorts here. 
So I mentioned the BioCard cohort. Um, in this cohort, we also looked at how inflammation related to brain functional connectivity. So BioCard is, is a neat cohort. It was started at NIH actually, and it was brought to Johns Hopkins um, in 2009. In 2009, and blood was taken in 2009. And using this blood, we collected a number of immune proteins. And we related these immune proteins to fMRI measures of functional connectivity. And particularly, we were interested in these intrinsic connectivity networks. So we're all from, most of you are probably familiar with these. These are essentially resting state networks. They're networks of correlated brain activity that occur within spatially distinct yet functionally related regions, right? And the neat thing about these resting state networks or these ICNs is that the strength of their connectivity relates to cognition and, and aspects of behavior, making them very relevant to, to people interested in neuropsychology. So we related this inflammatory index that was validated elsewhere to connectivity within each of these resting state networks. And the index used this inflammatory receptor, TNF-alpha receptor 1 that I mentioned earlier, shown to be associated with MCI. We used another one as well, IL-6 or interleukin-6. This is a commonly measured called inflammatory cytokine. We combined them both into this index and related them to a connectivity within each of these networks. So here's the result. Well, this is the default mode network and labeled in purple and blue here. So, you know, it's distributed and, you know, it's known probably most famously as the daydream network because it's on activated when we're daydreaming, but it's you know, a lot more important than, than that. It's also very relevant to autobiographic memory, uh, internally directed thought, planning, you know, moral reasoning, all kinds of stuff. And we see that individuals with their, a higher level of this inflammatory index, they have reduced connectivity within the default mode network measured six years later. So that's shown here. And when we break up the inflammatory index by its components, uh, we see that this association is driven by soluble TNF-alpha receptor 1 and not so much or not at all by interleukin-6. And we also looked at another resting state network called the dorsal attention network. Um, you know, it's made up of this distribution of green regions here. It's kind of the opposite of the default mode network. It's they're all involved in top-down control of attention outward. And we see same thing, higher levels of our inflammatory index are associated with reduced connectivity in this dorsal attention network. This time it's driven by interleukin-6. So we see this divergence in association uh, between these two pro-inflammatory proteins, both associated with reduced connectivity, but with different resting state networks. We actually looked at all of these and the strength of the, the we only saw that the default mode network and dorsal attention network were associated with uh, peripheral inflammation. Now, both of these networks are very interesting in their own right. Um, both have been associated with a number of neuropsychiatric conditions listed here. Default mode network, however, has really been linked time and time again with all of Amherst's disease. And I think some of the neatest findings over the last couple of decades in clinical neurosciences have been you know, this finding that linked default mode network to areas of brain changes in people who develop Alzheimer's disease. And I'll tell you what I'm, I mean. So we have our default mode network hubs um, labeled in blue here you know, retrosplenal cortex, posterior cingulate region, um, you know, inferior frontal, you know, temporal parietal region. These are the hubs of strong connectivity when the default mode network is activated. Now, people who do go on to develop Alzheimer's disease, we see this deposition of A beta amyloid beta 20 years or more before the onset of uh, clinically defined dementia. But this is, it's like a one-to-one -one mapping over the default mode network. We see this atrophy, you know, maybe like five to 10 years out here in the same regions and metabolic disruption in the same regions. And we know the posterior region, end of the default mode network is relevant for, for memory formation. And this has led some scientists to think that metabolic activity within this default mode network leads to changes within the neuron that are conducive to amyloid deposition. And, so it's clearly central to Alzheimer's disease. And what we're trying to figure out now is where peripheral inflammation fits into this. Now, I, you know, my group has shown in two different 
cohorts that there's really not a strong cross-sectional association between peripheral inflammation and amyloid deposition. And there's something there, but it's pretty weak and not consistent. But we do see this independent association between peripheral inflammation and connectivity within the deep lymphoma network that's fully independent of amyloid. So if this is actually a causal, or if there's a causal relationship here, it seems to be independent of cortical amyloid, but we're still trying to piece this together. Now I'm gonna switch gears a little and talk about acute inflammatory events. Um, so acute inflammatory events include many different things, but they're things that happen over a short period of time, things like infection, uh, pneumonia, you know, presumably COVID-19, and also things that you know, create major tissue damage. So you know, major surgeries, for example, but what they all have in common is they trigger this large yet transient inflammatory response that's many, many times higher in magnitude than what I was talking about before, where we're looking at low grade, well, markers of low grade inflammation in the blood. We're talking about big changes in inflammation over short periods of time now. And you know, these acute inflammatory events are, well, they are known to increase risk for cognitive decline, increased risk for dementia. And in the short term, I think you know, these events are responsible for a large proportion of cases of delirium. Now, the, you know, the, the pathophysiology or the framework is the same, except the triggers are now acute. And so too is the systemic inflammation, but I think the effects can be long lasting. Now, you know, my group and others have shown that these acute inflammatory events, you know, whether they be critical illness, things like sepsis and ARDS, or major infection like hospitalized pneumonia, or, or surgical intervention, you know, we've shown in our analysis that having some of these events, or one or more of these events, I should say, in the decades leading up to late life, does increase the likelihood of reduced brain volumes in regions that are vulnerable to Alzheimer's of pathology in that sort of Alzheimer's disease signature region that I mentioned. But other cohorts have shown that these sorts of exposures are also associated with cognitive decline, increased risk for dementia, and yeah, so the same, irrespective of what the event is, whether it be infection, critical illness, surgery, the common theme is that they all generate a very robust yet transient inflammatory response that sometimes may actually turn into a chronic response in some individuals, but they're thought to be you know, caused these adverse neurocognitive outcomes through the pathways that I mentioned earlier. So I talked about you know, a number of studies that have used these targeted protein assays looking at inflammatory proteins in blood. That's one way to do it. I've talked about these ac acute inflammatory events and we've linked those to neurocognitive outcomes as well. Now, another approach that we're taking, and this is all very recent, is using this proteome one approach or using proteomics. So, you know, the human proteome is very large. It's thought to include I think 20,000 or so individual proteins uh, at any one time. They're all circulating within uh, your, your plasma and serum. Now, it's been really difficult to measure these proteins in, you know, with a small amount of sample up until very recently. So this company called Somalogic has developed this platform called the SomaScan platform. They, it's allowed for the measurement of 5,000 proteins with a you know, very small amount of blood. And we've applied this technology to the ERIC cohort that I talked about earlier. And what we've, we're trying to do with this is understand the plasma proteomic signature that's associated with dementia risk. And the, the implicit hypothesis here is that using this data-driven approach that we'll see evidence for you know, the role of innate immune activation and inflammation uh, that, that's going to be sort of pointed to or highlighted uh, using this sort of agnostic proteomic approach. So I'll show you some results from this analysis. Now, the you know, this analysis took a number of steps, and this is all stuff that's under review right now. Um, so this is very preliminary data, and you know it's possible that some of it may change before it's final. But uh, you know the first step was to look at individual proteins in relation to dementia risk. So we looked at all five thousand proteins one by one in relation to dementia risk in our cohort. And let me just zoom in on this. So we measured these 5,000 proteins in about 4,000 people who were non-demented in late life. So they were in their mid-70s. 
And we related proteins one by one to dementia risk. It was over 400 incident, so new dementia cases. And uh, yes, oh, here are the results. Now, this is a volcano plot. On the x-axis, we have our hazard ratios. On the y-axis, we have our p-values. Everything labeled and in red are proteins that were associated with dementia risk um, after correction for multiple comparisons with, with the very conservative Ponferroni. So we're talking about very low p-values here. Now, you know, all in all, after this adjustment for a number of uh, potential confounders, we see that 38 proteins are, are strongly associated with dementia risk. This is 38 of the 5,000. So, we're, you know, we're very excited about that. We're, we're excited we see things that pass the Ponferroni uh, on threshold. And what we, the question we ask next is, okay, with these 38 dementia associated proteins, what happens if we measure them in midlife? So we took 38 proteins, you know, when we took the names of them and said, okay, let's measure them uh, 20 years earlier in the same, in an earlier wave of the ERIC cohort. And that's just what we did. So we measured these 38 proteins in 11,000 individuals. And determine the degree to which they were associated with dementia risk over this 20 year period that predates or the discovery date. So this is an independent set of dementia cases. So it's kind of like an independent replication, not fully, but you know, we really wanted to understand, you know, are these things relevant in the middle of the life? And you know, here, here's a sort of the study design. And like I said, 11,000 individuals, 1,100 cases. So we had you know, pretty good power to examine these. And here is the, the results of the primary analysis plotted against the results of that midlife replication analysis. So again, proteins that are highlighted in, well, in red and labeled are those that replicated in the midlife replication analysis. And so of the 38 that we looked at in this replication anal analysis, about half of them continue to show a significant association with dementia risk when we measured them in middle adulthood. So this was very cool. This means, you know, well, the, the sort of impetus for this second analysis was that you know, we, want, we want to find proteins that are causally relevant, etiologically relevant. And we think because we know the pathophysiology of dementia, it takes place over you know, two decades at least. If something's relevant to the disease process, it's probably going to show up um, in midlife as well as late life. So that's what we have here for about half of our dementia-associated proteins. The other half, they might be false positives, or they might just be relevant later in the disease, but I think they're less likely uh, causal. Now, you know, we also plot the hazard ratios, and you can see the ones that are significant or that replicate fall along this diagonal. That's neat because it shows that same sort of degree of association and same direction of association. Now, you know, one thing we wanted to do was to make sure this wasn't like a cohort-specific thing, so we were able to replicate a number of these findings in an external cohort. I would say most, the majority of them replicated in the AGES Reykjavik study. So this is a, a group of individuals, a cohort study done in Iceland, about 5,000 people, 10 years of dementia follow-up. Uh, they were gracious enough to let us see if the proteins replicated, and we're excited to know that they did. So we had some more confidence that we had discovered some, some new dementia-associated proteins. And then the next step was uh, to learn more about them using the genetic approach. So what we did was we conducted a genome-wide association study of protein level, of plasma protein level for the dementia-associated proteins. We wanted to know which genetic variants coded for plasma protein level of these dementia-associated proteins. And because we would then, in using this Mendelian randomization approach, look at how uh, those genetic variants that code for protein level themselves relate to Alzheimer's disease risk. So this is kind of called a two-sample Mendelian randomization analysis, and that's what we did. So these are the, you know, the summary statistics for our, G, our GWAS, and these are just the top five proteins. I'm just showing you top five. Um, so SVP1 was our top protein. It was measured twice. That's why it's listed twice here, but we identified single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs um, that were associated with all but one of the top five proteins, and this is the number of SNPs, and these SNPs are otherwise called PQTLs or protein quantitative trait loci. But what we did is we looked at how these PQTLs or SNPs related to Alzheimer's disease risk. So looking at how SNPs that code for protein level relate to Alzheimer's disease risk. 
So essentially we're looking at the genetic overlap between the two. And this is a Mendelian randomization analysis. What's neat about this is, it, well, some people call it Nature's clinical trial because it relies on this random allocation of alleles across the population. And it, it circumvents or issues related to confounding, which are, are big in cohort studies, and reverse causation, another big issue for these cohort studies. And we can sort of interpret the findings as a causal. Now we use, the, for the Alzheimer's disease, GWAS, we use external data. There's plenty of GWAS data that's freely available. So we didn't need to do that ourselves. And yeah, we looked at that overlap and we found overlap in the in genetic architecture uh, between SVP1 and anthrax toxin receptor 2 and Alzheimer's disease, suggesting that, you know, according to this Mendelian randomization analysis, these proteins may be causally relevant. So what do we know about these? So SVP1 isn't well characterized. It's a protein that facilitates adhesion to the inside of uh, the vasculature, to the endothelium, in the context of inflammation. And a GWAS study for septic shock outcomes, and sepsis being a, an acute inflammatory event, uh, did implicate SVP1, but it has never before been implicated in dementia or any other neurologic outcome. Anthrax toxin receptor 2, something similar. It's a cellular adhesion molecule associated with lymphocyte count, so white blood cell uh, count, and uh, it has been linked to functional connectivity in a GWAS. But these are fairly novel proteins. They're both causally linked to Alzheimer's disease based on our analysis, and they both may represent peripheral drug targets. Now, we know from recent work that uh, targets, drug targets that have genetic support are much, much more likely to ultimately become successful with therapeutics. So we have genetic support here. We have sort of epidemiological support for both of these in it and some others that we identified. But both of these targets are highly relevant to inflammation and uh, immune function. And this is using, again, an agnostic approach to identify these proteins. So uh, we did a number of other things. You know, we looked at gene expression or gene co-expression for the genes that code for dementia associated proteins in blood and brain. And we saw some correspondence, but you know, for some proteins, we did not see some, some correspondence. Um, but I don't have time to get into that. We also looked at how these dementia associated proteins related to neuroimaging characteristics, both MRI and PET, uh, amyloid PET specifically. But I wanna actually finish by talking about our pathway analysis, because I think it was particularly informative. So what we did was we took we took a bigger set of dementia-associated proteins. So I told you before we looked at 38 that passed von Froni correction. Now, what we did for this analysis was take all those that passed that FDR correction. So still corrected for multiple comparisons, just a little less conservative, but we needed a big set of proteins to identify the biology underlying them. And so we took these two, 212 and we looked to try to determine the degree to which these 212 proteins overlap with proteins known to exist in other, in other biologic pathways. So all of these pathways listed here are, you know, show significant overlap with the dementia associated proteins that we identified. Those pathways that are, have bar, when the bars are the extent of overlap represented in, in p-value. The, the, um, the orange bars, I guess, are, uh, I say activated pathways. So these are pathways that, based on our analysis, are predicted to be activated. The blue bars are pathways that are predicted to be inhibited. And the, the gray bars, you know, the pathways that were enriched, but, you know, the direction couldn't be uh, surmised from our analysis. But these are relevant, or thought to be relevant pathways as well. But we see some themes. We see a number of pathways that are involved in lipid and cholesterol metabolism. Again, we know this is relevant to Alzheimer's disease already. We know, we see a number of pathways that are very relevant to hemostasis, coagulation, and vascular function. So that was neat to see. We see a number of pathways that you know, are relevant to inflammation, and those tend to be activated. And then a number of pathways that are involved in innate immune, in the innate immune response, more broadly speaking. And that's a little bit more varied in its direction of activation. So you know, one of the other things we did with using this sort of computational biology approach is we tried to identify groups or networks of proteins. 
um, based on known molecular and genetic relationship. And using this software, we were able to identify 12 protein networks. And so this is from the 212 dementia associated proteins we identified. And we identified hub proteins and see in the center that sort of have the highest level of connectivity within the network. So we know because all these protein networks are made up of dementia associated proteins that you know, the, the network expression itself is associated with dementia risk. But we wanted to see you know, which networks were particularly important. So we threw them all into the same Cox regression analysis and had them compete with each other essentially to see which were independently associated with dementia risk in that same sample. And we saw five sort of win out and five protein networks that showed consistent associations with dementia risk uh, over and above the others. So we actually looked deeper into these five and what we did was we functional, we profiled them using sort of gene ontology enrichment software. Uh, but essentially same thing, seeing, asking the question of, okay, what are these proteins represent? What do these proteins within the network represent in terms of biology? And network four seemed to represent immune function. All right, and the actual results are over here on the right. Five, we got extracellular matrix organization, into peptidase activity for network six, you see RNA metabolism for network eight, and then a number of things for, for network 10, including lipid binding and cholesterol metabolism here. So network four actually was the most strongly associated with the metro risk. And you know, I really wanted to pursue it because you know, it was relevant to, to immune function. So we looked into this further. This is just a network four zoomed in, and we're gonna call it the immune network because when we look to see what it's enriched for in our gene ontology enrichment analysis. We see a number of things, cytokine activity, leukocyte activation, that's activation of our immune cells. And then I was most excited about this one over here, microglia pathogen phagocytosis. So we see proteins like TREM1 and TREM2, which are known to be relevant to microglia activation included in the network. And you know, this is to say that this, the degree of uh, peripheral expression of this protein network might be relevant to how well microglia are functioning within the brain. We think of microglia pathogen phagocytosis as something that clears amyloid. And so low expression of these phagocytic proteins may, you know, may be harmful or may uh, prevent for the uh, adaptive immune response within the brain. So we looked further to see if that's what we're seeing. We, we see that individuals, and this is a Kaplan-Meier plot of uh, immune protein network expression. So we, we group people, quartile people based on the degree to which they express this immune network. And we see that those with the lowest quartile of this immune network expression have a much higher risk for developing dementia over of this five-year follow-up period. So we also looked at what this immune network, what this immune network expression uh, means in terms of its relevance to neuroimaging characteristics. And so in a set of about 2000 people who had neuroimaging and um, were non-demented, we showed that uh, this immune network expression was strongly associated with neurodegenerative features like total brain volume loss, Alzheimer's disease signature region volume loss, and white matter hyperintensity volume, but unrelated to cortical amyloid. And so these, and all these numbers are p-values and the colors represents the, the actual effect size. So very interesting, you know, we're seeing a strong relationship with neurodegeneration, seems to be independent of amyloid here. So just to summarize, we identified this network of circulating immune proteins, it seems to be dysregulated in the years preceding dementia onset. And this is what the network looks like. The expression of this network seems to be strongly associated with dementia risk, very strongly associated with dementia risk, but also associated with neurodegeneration. But again, this association seems to be independent of cortical amyloid. So we also, we going forward and in, in the future, what we hope to do is determine whether or not this protein network is causally relevant uh, to Alzheimer's disease risk, like what we did with the specific proteins, SVP1 and anthrax toxin receptor 2. We can use some of those same methods to understand uh, if sort of this is causally relevant and if it's for uh, potentially targeting to reduce Alzheimer's disease risk. And from a translational perspective, um, NF-kappa-B is this pro-inflammatory transcription factor that regulates uh, the immune network, especially the pro-inflammatory immune network. 
and there's evidence from other sort of rodent, well, not rodent models, this is a fly model here, um, that shows that in a kappa B expression in the brain is associated with neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration and actually reduces the lifespan. So, you know, we have multiple species where we're seeing that in a kappa B expression seems to be relevant uh, to brain health. So just to summarize the proteomic findings, there seems to be this plasma proteomic signature that's associated with subsequent dementia risk, right? And it, it seems to implicate a number of biologic pathways, including inflammatory signaling, innate immune activation, just speaking more broadly, and that includes endothelial activation and uh, macrophage activation. And then you know, vascular function seems to be strongly implicated as well. So coagulation, hemostasis, as well as cholesterol and lipid metabolism. So a number of biologic pathways seem to be um, enriched among the proteins that are associated with dementia, suggesting a relevance for these, these biologic pathways in, uh, in dementia risk in Alzheimer's disease development. Now we've identified this network of immune proteins that seems to be strongly associated with dementia risk and neurodegeneration that's totally independent of amyloid. So we hope to look into that in future analysis um, and I want to say that there's a strong degree of overlap between what we see when we look at proteomic analysis and sort of the, the genetic architecture of Alzheimer's disease. And this suggests that some of those risk variants, those risk genes that confer risk for Alzheimer's disease might be actually operating through peripheral biology and not just uh, through the brain. So, you know, this is hope for that targeting uh, per peripheral biology may ultimately result in reduced uh, reduction of risk for the disease. So with that, I'll stop and I wanna you know, definitely acknowledge all the participants and the study staff that made all this possible. These, you know, work with a number of large cohorts that are, you know, that involve tons of hands and standing on the shoulders of giants really. I wanna thank my primary mentor, Rebecca Gottesman, who's really made a lot of this possible. And of course my funding sources. And I really want to, again, uh, leave this up here, anyone who, uh, really like this work, is looking for a postdoc opportunity. You know, we're looking to extend some of this in a new lab at NIH. So um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about the opportunity, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Walker. That was really wonderful. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, so first question is related to um, Alzheimer's disease patients that can have subclinical seizures. Um, so this question says, we know that seizures lead to brain inflammation. Is it possible that this subset of AD patients are experiencing greater inflammation, doing, uh, inflammation due to ongoing seizure activity? Yeah, I would say, so I haven't looked at that specifically and I'm not aware of anyone who has tried to connect those dots. The, you know, I, I think there's something to it, certainly you know, seizures and Alzheimer's disease, seizures and dementia more broadly, you know, are closely tied together. And you know, so too is neuroinflammation and seizures. So I would suspect that, that the three of them, you know, sort of may have some synergistic uh, effects on increasing risk for cognitive decline and uh, progression of the disease. But that's, that's a good point. I, I actually work with a colleague who's an epileptologist uh, who might be interested in that sort of thing. So yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Okay, um, the next question is about, uh, let's see, so it says your research is certainly exciting. So thank you for sharing an in-depth view with us. Um, how would you translate these findings into any practical recommendations for patients at this point? Yeah, so, well, yeah, I get that question a lot and it's definitely understandable. I don't think we're, well, I guess the major question is, you know, can we use these biomarkers at this point to sort of, you know, see who's at risk and you know, predict progression of stratified people into analysis, you know, clinical trials, for example. Um, and I don't think we're there with the inflammatory biomarkers yet. I think there's much better biomarkers. Most of what the, of the work I'm doing is looking at to risk factors, which I think of as something that's distinct. But with that, I will say that there's, I think, fairly consistent evidence that systemic inflammation 
particularly when it occurs in middle adulthood, seems to be a risk factor. So, you know, the applicability of this sort of stuff is that, you know, we need to make sure that, especially during middle life, but probably before that, we do things that reduce risk for systemic inflammation. And that's not going to be, not that's not just going to be helpful for reducing risk for dementia or cognitive decline, or, but also for all sorts of other conditions. We know, you know, diabetes, a number of cancers, you know, inflammation is a major risk factor for a number of, of, of these chronic conditions. So what I tell people you know, is you know, preventing diseases. The, I mentioned a number of diseases, you know, the ones surrounding uh, our cartoon, Peter Griffin there. Preventing those sort of diseases are going to be important to reducing inflammation. You know, exercise is important. Diet, you know, there's an anti-inflammatory diet, there's a Mediterranean diet. All of those have been shown to be associated with reduced uh, pro-inflammatory proteins in the blood, which you know, I think will ultimately reduce one's risk for developing you know, these sort of chronic conditions. So that's where we're at in terms of the quantified applicability now. Hopefully we can translate some of these things to actual therapeutics in the near future. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, and thank you for giving some of your thoughts around that as well. Um, our next question is about uh, so, uh, psychosocial and psychiatric factors that may affect the infla inflammatory process. Um, this person says studies have found that trauma leads to increased inflammation. Do you think that that may have any role in um, your research or in what you've found? Yeah, there, I think there's a lot there and there's some pretty good work on the sort of the psychiatric components of neuro and systemic inflammation. And in addition to trauma, things like depression, um, you know, depression is, is strongly tied to at least systemic inflammation. I know one study that actually used PET imaging to look at individuals who were treat, treatment refractory, uh, who developed depression, and they showed strong neuroinflammation. So I think there, there's, you know, I think trauma depression, stress, like just gen in general stress, um, all of these things can promote an inflammatory response or a maladaptive immune response peripherally. And that may, may be one of the pathways through which we get you know, from uh, you know, these psychiatric conditions to adverse neurocognitive outcomes. You know, just one of the, the many, I'm sure, pathways. And, and I will say there is some work on um, neuroticism as well and in neuroinflammation. So there, I think you know, there's a lot of strong connections there between sort of psychiatric uh, conditions and both central and peripheral inflammation. But like the directionality still I think needs to be sorted out. You know, there is, I've done one analysis which show that individuals who do show like chronic inflammation over a 20 year period between uh, middle adulthood and late life, they are, at, higher risk for developing late life depression, uh, you know, as older adults. So, you know, but I think also depression increases inflammation. So there's, there's some bi-directionality there, but it is an interesting point. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, those were our questions for today and we are at our time. So thank you so much, Dr. Walker. We got several comments thanking you for your presentation. Um, and we're definitely going to be on the lookout for your upcoming work. So thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. This was, this was truly an honor. All right. Bye, everyone.